Monthly Edition of NRTRC's Monthly Webinar. I'm Bob Wolverton, Program Director of NRTRC, and uh, I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to welcome you, tell you what's coming up, and then we'll talk to, talk to our presenters today. On the screen in the middle, you'll see that our next webinar is on Telemental Health, and that will be presented by Marlene Mayfield on December 18th. Again, that's a little bit early in the month for when we usually have our presentations, but there are these holidays that we could explain. I also would like to recommend that you uh, save the date for our 2015 Telemedicine Conference in Seattle, Washington. That will be at the end of March. And we're, uh, we're putting up together a great program for you. Over on the side of the, the screen, you'll see that we have a number of pods that have some interesting information in them. We've got a list of attendees. Down here in the file pod, you can click on PDF slides and download today's presentation. And you can click on the conference uh, save the date card just to get yourself a reminder of when our conference will be coming to Seattle. In the web links file down below, you'll have a link to our website. You can look at what we've got to offer and find recordings of this and all of our, all of our previous webinars. You're more than welcome to come in and look at them, look to what we have available for training materials. And then there's a link to the uh, our survey. Uh, we'd like to have you take the survey because it's important to us to know what you thought, not only of today's presentation, but what you would like to see in future webinars. We're working on filling out our card for next year, so we would love to have some ideas and thoughts about presenters or subject matter. At the bottom, you'll see a chat pod. This is a pod for everyone who has uh, uh, technical questions or operational questions. That'll go uh, to Martha and me, and we'll try to, uh, we'll try to answer questions and, and fix problems if you're seeing it. And then over to the left of that is the Q&A pod. That's the important pod. That's where you can ask questions of our presenters. Um, you can type them in at any time. They'll kind of be monitoring the pod and respond to them. Uh, Larry, I, it's probably uh, based on your connection. Uh, we have a, some problems with, uh, with audio on and off around the, uh, all over the all different areas. So uh, I'm thinking that it's probably the connectivity that, that we're looking at. OK, let me introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Dr. Ben Green is the Medical Director for Clinical Innovation at Corina Incorporated. In his role as Medical Director, he has helped the Western and Corina's transition to virtual healthcare and telemedicine, and he's built a team of medical professionals focused on this novel field. In addition to developing a virtual training platform for the Corina medical team, Dr. Green also serves as the clinical lead for Corina's software delivery system. Uh, which emphasize the efficient patient and provider workflows and integrated clinical decision support. Dr. Green is board certified in family medicine. He holds a BA from Harvard. He attended the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey, and he completed his residency in family medicine from the University of Pennsylvania. Joining Dr. Green today will be Aaron Haas, who is a board certified family nurse practitioner also with Korean Medical Providers, and who also works at the University of Washington Medical Center Emergency Department. Aaron previously worked in community and rural health for seven years as a National Health Service Corps Scholar, and he received his training at the University of Washington and Seattle University. In addition to his clinical role with Karina, he has helped develop the virtual training platform for providers who are new to their virtual care. So gentlemen, Unmute your mics and thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Bob, and welcome everyone. Um, hopefully, the audio works. It looks like we're having a few comments about quality, so please type in if you're having any issues with Dr. Green or myself. So, so welcome everyone to our presentation for uh, the need for a tailored and telemedicine-specific training program for the new virtual clinical workforce. Um, I'm Aaron Oss, and I have a dual role with Karina. I perform virtual care myself, but I'm also involved in the creation of our uh, 
training platform for training our own internal providers and for training providers uh, in other systems. And prior to this, as Bob said, I was in um, primary care and community health for seven years. So um, in creating the curriculum, I draw a lot on my own experience from transitioning from in-person to virtual care. So while we as a company have created a curriculum uh, specific to virtual urgent care today, the main purpose of our talk is to, stay, is to take a step back and look at some lessons that we've learned, look at the process that we went through and are going through. Uh, we'll talk about some factors that argue for the creation of a unique curriculum. We'll talk about some barriers to training and provider reluctance. We'll talk about our own experiences as an organization that chose to go through this transition uh, with the purpose being to see us as just one example and hopefully you can extrapolate and uh, get some take home lessons here. And um, finally, while our, our um, company mostly does uh, virtual urgent care, not chronic disease management, um, a lot of the same arguments can be made. So I think some of the lessons will apply to um, some of our listeners out there. Uh, specifically in our objectives, um, we're not going to go over any one curriculum or our own curriculum in detail, but we want to look at the concept of education and curriculum on a meta level. Uh, we're going to talk about the current telemedicine environment. We'll talk about uh, resistance to providers new, uh, resistance that some uh, providers new to telemedicine may have. We'll break down some of the challenges on both the clinical side and the organizational side. We will look at some data that support virtual patient assessment and how this can fit into the curriculum. Uh, we'll talk about some training strategies that we have used and we'll share our thoughts on these. And we'll talk about um, ongoing education uh, within a geographically distributed provider group. And we'll also briefly discuss a few challenges, um, some of the main ones that we know people are interested in hearing about, such as prescribing, um, antibiotics, and um, we'll go from there. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Green. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to be here and, uh, and to talk to you all. And I think Aaron gave a, a great overview there. Um, and we'll be going back and forth uh, in terms of presenting here. And um, so, you know, I guess the first question, you know, we ask, you know, in, in presenting this this talk is, you know, do we need training uh, for telemedicine providers? And um, you know, this is a question that, that you know, we came upon uh, about five years ago. And, um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, the answer to, for us was, was yes. And, and obviously there's a lot of industry uh, precedent and a lot of things going on in the world of telemedicine um, that really uh, lend itself to, uh, to training uh, this new clinical workforce. Um, so the American Telemedicine Association um, you know, the you know, obviously the one of the leading bodies you know, in the in the world of telemedicine uh, clearly states that uh, training a skilled, competent workforce is is essential to providing high quality telemedicine. So um, you know, so so you know, we've looked at this, and you know, I'm sure other you know, telemedicine uh, delivery uh, services and delivery providers um, are looking looking at, at the ATA as um, you know, as, as, as a guide to determine, um, you know, how to train providers and how to, uh, you know, how to, you know, give them the tools necessary to deliver uh, telemedicine. The other things we're seeing uh, in, uh, you know, in the media and in other uh, healthcare publications is, uh, is a rec recognition that telemedicine uh, delivery is, is a unique uh, care model, uh, bed, bedside manner as it relates to a virtual interaction um, is is a, is a new thing, uh, you know. So um, so a lot of uh, you know, publications are also uh, really you know setting the expectation that um, this is truly a new clinical competency um, with a lot of other other issues to consider when delivering telemedicine. Obviously, the momentum for telemedicine is is not slowing down. Um, you know, just you know, a few of the estimates you know that that we're seeing um, you know, from Deloitte, uh, they they expect about 75 million e visits here in North America this year. Uh, Towers Watson recently uh, published uh, a publication regarding employer-based telemedicine and and how uh, you know the the growth for for you know that population is is really extraordinary. Um, and then some other consultants are. Are estimating that you know by by 2018, uh, you know we're going to see uh, on on upwards of 130 million uh, 
the telemedicine uh, consultations. So clearly the volume of telemedicine encounters is, is going up and up and, uh, and, you know, and we feel that uh, training the, the workforce appropriately um, with you know, understanding of the nuts and bolts of telemedicine as well as the clinical, uh, clinical components of telemedicine is really essential. You know, just doing a, a quick internet search and looking at, you know, what are, what are consumers looking for, uh, you know, on, on internet searches. And just since 2005, um, the search terms for mHealth, online urgent care, uh, have really, have really skyrocketed. So, so patients, consumers are expecting care you know, to be delivered this way. Uh, and, and our you know, provider community is, is obviously beginning to deliver care this way. Um, but you know, in a way that you know that we feel you know education is 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 necessary. So I'm going to just touch on a couple of the um, uh, some industry and policy statements that that really echo uh, the need for for appropriate training. So you know, as as most of you know, in in June of, of this year, the AMA came out with their policy statement on on telemedicine, um, and really what it did was establish a lot of the regulatory considerations for delivering telemedicine, uh, as well as the clinical considerations. So uh, really outlining that providers and delivery services um, must abide by state rules and, and federal, other, federal regulations to, to deliver uh, telemedicine appropriately. But you know, in my mind, most importantly, they, they focused on the clinical aspect of telemedicine and also acknowledged the lack of clinical practice guidelines and evidence-based medicine uh, you know, related to telemedicine. So, so really called on the industry to, uh, to set the standard for, you know, for creating guidelines uh, and furthermore, you know, really establishing appropriate training for, for providers. The, um, the FSMB in April of this year also came out with their policy, which, uh, which I think most of us feel the will be adopted into most state medical boards policies. Uh, and again, echoed the fact that there are clear regulations that providers must abide by, um, as well as clinical components that, uh, that would make a telemedicine encounter uh, on par with an in-person encounter. So, so these were you know, some of the momentum behind um, uh, you know, validating you know, the telemedicine uh, training program that, that, we've, uh, that we've initiated here. So with that, I will uh, I will uh, send it back over to Aaron for some other uh, some other examples. Thank you, Ben. So um, there are several existing telemedicine specific educational programs out there, and up on your screen you can see some examples of a few uh, that we came across when we were searching. And these are all um, fairly robust, excellent programs. Uh, from what we could see, they seem to be quite a mix of um, clinical programs designed for practicing providers and also um, programs that are designed more for administrators uh, with the intent of setting up uh, telemedicine programs. Um, so even though these do seem to be excellent programs, obviously in comparison to traditional uh, CME and training offerings, the absolute number um, is still fairly small. Uh, interestingly, some traditional medical schools and related programs are starting to come up with some solutions for provider training as well. Um, a lot of these are niche programs, obviously designed for specific specialties or for aspects of telemedicine. Uh, in your lower left there, you can see the ACGME has um, some program um, designed for telemedicine, um, the use of telemedicine for precepting. So, um, but very few of these programs are comprehensive programs for entering students, for residents, or for new graduates. Um, there have been some early efforts to isolate virtual care as a specialty, though in our searchings, we haven't um, come across um, anything beyond um, some initial uh, publications and musings over this. We do expect in upcoming years that these offerings will be expanded and hopefully give organizations a useful array of options uh, to choose from so they don't need to create entire curricula from scratch themselves. The main question we have is what about your current provider workforce? And we assume that a lot of our listeners are um, with existing organizations right now. Um, much of our own internal work is focused on bridging the transition from traditional to virtual care. 
and um, we've encountered a, a number of challenges, and we just wanted to break those um, to break those down. Um, any educational program, regardless of the setting you work in, um, we feel does need to address both uh, clinical challenges designed in just the the actual practice of, of medicine, um, and also some more administrative operational uh, challenges. So moving on, um, talking a bit about the clinical side of things, one of the biggest issues you'll encounter are scope of practice issues. This includes uh, safe physical assessment, appropriateness uh, or eligibility for virtual visits. Uh, there are so many judgment calls involved in treating even simple issues. Uh, in the clinic, you may have a kid uh, coming in with an otalgia, with some ear pain, um, and there really is no, no major challenge here. Um, but on the virtual side of things, unless you have a digital otoscope or some other way to visualize the ear, um, this, there can be some questions about um, scope of practice here. So even simple issues, this question may arise. Um, even though there are some good practice guidelines in existence, the ATA serves in part as a clearinghouse for some of these guidelines, there still is a relative absence of a robust body of virtual practice guidelines for telemedicine uh, practice. Uh, there's also a question of prescribing policies. Uh, this may vary state to state, uh, may vary institution to institution. Uh, there are questions of legality and obviously of antibiotics and controlled substances. So any program does need to address these as well. Um, and finally, there is a question about how comprehensive any program uh, needs to be. Um, will just a few hours of continuing ed suffice or does it need to be a more robust ongoing a program that's even certified by a body? And then moving on to the right side of your screen to more of the organizational and operational challenges. Um, there's obviously privacy issues and HIPAA compliance. Um, there are technical issues, just the basics of working a webcam, both on the providers and on the patients. And uh, there are licensing issues. This is gonna be more of an issue if your providers are working in multiple states where scope of practice laws for uh, physicians and for um, PAs and nurse practitioners vary quite a bit. Um, continuity of care, or more appropriately, ensuring continuity of care is a major issue in telemedicine. And uh, finally, because of some patients' unfamiliarity with telemedicine and the inability to sit face-to-face -to -face with their providers, there may still be some skepticism about the legitimacy. They may question if the provider's license. They may question if they're even located in the United States. Uh, they may even be wondering if they flunked out of their training or if they got fired from their last job and are just using this as uh, a backup job. And with that, I will pass it back to Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so, you know, you know, clearly, you know, I, I think the, the stage has been set for, you know, the, recognizing the need for um, you know, a training program. Um, and I, I think, you know, what, what we'll do here is, is explain a little bit about Karina and, and how, um, how we deliver uh, telemedicine care um, and how we've built our, our training program um, as an example and, and really as, as, a, as one way to uh, to educate a, a current provider uh, workforce, um, you know, in, in you know, in delivering um, you know, telemedicine care in a high quality way. Um, so Karina is a is a, a is a company based in Seattle um, of medical professionals, um, technology professionals, uh, consumer service professionals, um, all you know, working together uh, to create um, a you know, a virtual visit uh, service. Um, we provide care for uh, employer groups as well as health systems looking to uh, deploy uh, virtual visits. Uh, and these virtual visits are, are an urgent care type of, of service. Um, and currently the, the service is available um, uh, in multiple states across the country. Uh, the evolution of Karina, I think, um, is an interesting one uh, in that uh, Karina was founded as a, as a primary care medical group um, by a family physician um, in Seattle. Uh, who was looking for another way to deliver care to his own patients. Uh, so he started doing in-person house calls for, uh, for his patients, um, really created a great patient experience and, and provider experience. Um, and that got, uh, you know, that got um, a couple employer groups interested in offering in-person care to, to employees. So Costco and Microsoft were, were two early adopters of the in-person house call model um, uh, that, that Karina was offering. 
Um, soon thereafter, though, the, the determination was made that a lot of these in-person house calls could be delivered virtually um, uh, you know, in very much the same way. So, so in 2009, um, what we did is, is, is really looked at the clinical, uh, the clinical state of our practice and, uh, and really wanted to determine if, in fact, we could deliver virtual house calls. So that in-person house call now you know, delivering that behind a webcam or, or you know behind a behind a telephone. Um, so you know, so the evolution of um, you know of our medical practice into an exclusive virtual practice um, really you know really uh, you know there was a lot of effort that that uh, that occurred at that point. Um, since then, uh, you know, as I said, we've we've really morphed into um, you know into a telemedicine organization and telemedicine practice. Um, delivering what we call uh, virtual house calls. Um, so, so I, you know, I think the evolution of of Krina from then till now, um, uh, you know, and then how did we do that? Uh, and, and really, I think a training is it was a big part of that. The, um, you know, so if we look at uh, the Krina team in two thousand nine, um, you know, this was a, a group of of family medicine uh, physicians. Um, who you know, exclusively were, were trained in in-person care. Uh, you know, they were delivering home visits you know, for, for our, our patients, and um, you know, many of them were working at other in-person clinics or had uh, you know, come from in-person clinics. Um, you know, they were licensed in only one state. Uh, they were you know, a collaborative clinical team, but um, you know, not, you know, not delivering you know, virtual, virtual care at the time. Um, you know, very, very adherent to clinical practice guidelines regarding in-person care, but, but again, um, you know, uh, no prior knowledge of, of any virtual practice guidelines. Um, and, and most of them, you know, have never, had never, you know, delivered care behind a webcam or, um, you know, or, or, you know, prescribed medications, you know, through a, through a virtual encounter. Um, so, so this was kind of the team we were working with when we made the evolution, you know, into, into a virtual practice. If we look at our team today um, and how far we've come, uh, you know, I think this is really, uh, you know, highlights the fact that um, we, we, we really had to train this, this team appropriately. Um, so now our providers, um, you know, for the most part, are, are employed um, to deliver virtual care uh, exclusively. Um, you know, we like to call our, our team a team of, of virtualists, um, and we have a, a mix of, of family medicine physicians and nurse practitioners. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, they are they are devoted to telemedicine practice, um, you know, which I think is is a unique unique thing. Um, we do have a, a mix of experienced providers and new graduates. So so in, in thinking about training, um, you know, there's there's you know different competencies that that our providers um, have, and, and I'm sure your providers um, as well are, are coming coming from much different experiences. Um, now our team is licensed in in multiple states. Uh, we still you know, foster that collaborative clinical culture, but uh, but this is one where there's there's a challenge in doing that uh, when when you have a remote workforce. Um, and then I think one of the biggest pieces is the fact that our providers are now uh, really adherent to virtual practice guidelines. So so what they knew you know to be you know to be right in in-person care, uh, we've now uh, you know, transitioned them to to understand. Uh, what is evidence-based medicine, you know, in a, in a virtual world? What is safe medicine in a virtual world? Um, you know, and what is you know high-quality medicine? So, so that is really the um, you know the, the practice that that they uh, that they adhere to. Um, you know, other pieces I think you know of of our team that is that is unique is in, in that they are um, compensated somewhat based on patient satisfaction, um, which is is a big part of our our training program as well. Um, how do you deliver a, a satisfying visit behind a webcam? So, so again, another uh, another piece to to the training program. So, you know, I, I touched on this uh, earlier, but but how did we truly get here? Um, you know, in, in 2009, you know, we we looked at the the state of telemedicine at the time and, and looked at the regulatory issues and licensure requirements, um, but. But even more so, we looked at the clinical practice guidelines and the, the evidence related to telehealth uh, and really looked at that and, and, and uh, incorporated that into our training program. Uh, so until we started delivering virtual visits, we, uh, you know, we, we had to train our, our team appropriately. So, 
Um, so it was it was twofold, as as Aaron mentioned, uh, the clinical considerations and then um, then the operational considerations. Uh, and it took for us about a year, a little over a year, to to properly train our providers. Um, and now, when we bring providers on, we we go through um, you know that that same you know, extensive training program. It doesn't take a year, obviously, but um, you know, but it, but this is this is the learning that uh, that we that we had to, to do that. Um, so, what were the responses from our team? And, and these are probably a lot of the responses from from your teams or, or providers who've never delivered telemedicine. Uh, you know, before, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is is clinically. Uh, you know, can I deliver care without an exam, without a lab test, without imaging? Um, you know, so that was a, obviously a big piece of of our training program. Um, you know, obviously the, the the legal restrictions. You know, is this is this legal? Can I do this? Uh, does my malpractice cover this? Uh, you know, I'm not licensed in in California or whatever state. So so obviously providers are are very wary of of, of that, um, you know, coming in cold to telemedicine. Uh, prescribing is, is certainly another big area, and, and we're going to touch on that a, a little bit later. Um, and then, you know, for the less technologically savvy providers, the providers, um, you know, not everyone is comfortable behind a webcam. So, uh, so that's an, another big piece of, of, of training a, a provider appropriately. Um, and then I, you know, I think the the other the other the last two um, are that you know patients won't like this, and you know I think for the provider most importantly is is they won't like this, um, and I think uh, you know in our experience you know we've um, I think we've uh, we've fostered um, a lot of uh, patient satisfaction, but but equally important I think provider satisfaction I think uh, having a provider uh, enjoying what they do enjoying practicing virtually. Uh, really helps to translate into a positive experience for the patient. So, so again, a big piece of of our our training program. So the guidelines themselves, um, you know, I, we've we've talked a lot about the clinical considerations in 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 a training program. Um, and you know, what 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 we did was, um, you know, we we come, came up with. Um, our virtual practice guidelines, and this is really a, a big piece of, of a, the training program. And, and in any training program, whether it's for uh, virtual urgent care or virtual specialty care, um, you know, obviously, you know, clinical uh, clinical guidelines and, and clinical considerations, you know, should be you know should be the, the foundation. Um, so we looked at our our own clinical experience as well as uh, you know published data. And, uh, and came up with guidelines that, that emphasize safety, best practices, and, and clinical quality, and uh, embed these at the point of care in our software. Um, but, but also importantly, these are a, a very big component of, of the training program that, um, that exists. So, so with that, I'm gonna uh, send this back over to Aaron, and, and he's gonna um, explain our training program in a little bit more detail, and um, so, Thank you, Ben. So we titled our curriculum Karina University. And again, the purpose of this talk is not to talk about our program in detail, but to talk about its themes and to extrapolate to some of the essential components of any training program that any of our listeners might be involved in creating. Um, first and foremost, we found that um, having the curriculum reside on an online learning management system that was not intranet dependent uh, made it more accessible to, um, to a mobile and spread out provider team. Um, and we also find that found that having it emphasize just a wide range of issues that I alluded to earlier uh, was pretty important, including operational issues, legal issues, uh, the nitty gritty such as how to interview patients uh, virtually, um, clinical uh, processes and guidelines, um, ec patient expectations, uh, reimbursement um, was all very important. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the conceptual model that we came up with for the curriculum before we even created the curriculum. Um, and I'm sharing this because I think it's it's very easy to get focused on the technology and the novel 
aspects of telemedicine. Um, but as with traditional medicine, our core purpose is the same, which is safe clinical care and good clinical outcomes. And everything else we do is just peripheral to that and in support of this mission. So when we were creating curriculum, we actually had this model up and, and at at least at one point in the creation of it, um, we felt that we were straying from this too far and kind of redirected our efforts um, just to have everything surrounding the actual, um, the actual clinical aspects of it. There are many different learning management system platforms available to any organization creating an online program. Some are free, some charge fees, and most are very customizable to the point where uh, you can brand them yourselves and, and have it look like um, it's something that is created entirely internally. Um, what's nice about this for any organization is that you do not need to have your own IT team to run a training program. Uh, these are very user friendly. Um, we just have um, myself and Dr. Green are the only two people involved in this. Um, it's um, very easy to organize by courses. You can add quizzes. There's a nice dashboard that any users will have where they can see their progress. They can see the library of courses that they can take. And um, the administrators of, of these, whoever is involved in the um, creation of the curriculum, will get regular feedback on, um, on when users have completed courses, if they've taken quizzes. And um, it's very easily customizable. So if you have any changes you need to make to any of your curriculum, it's very easy to go in and change it quickly. So we highly recommend using um, a system such as this. Um, when creating a program, it's also very important to consider the format. Um, options can include simple PowerPoints, videos, demonstrations, interactive presentations. Um, but it is important to remember that many, if not most, of your providers are experienced and some of the content may be redundant. Um, so therefore, in our experience and in the feedback we've received from providers, we found some consistent themes. Um, one is that providers tend to want varied presentation styles, not just a series of, say, a dozen boring PowerPoints. So um, vary it as much as possible. Um, they universally have liked audio commentary. So even if um, the slide seems self-explanatory, even just adding 10 seconds of audio, um, we found our providers were pretty happy with that. Um, quizzes should be used with caution. So while they may ensure that learners do pay attention, they can also come across as meddlesome um, or pedantic. So they, um, so they should be focused on clinical content, not just as tools to ensure that providers are paying attention. Um, we also recommend that the curriculum be customizable. So as new providers come on and as you as an organization gain virtual care experience, um, the training needs may change. So whatever format you have, as long as it's something that can be easily customizable, would certainly benefit you. Um, and these are just some screenshots of examples that we have. Um, it's very easy to create some modules in PowerPoint and then, um, and then go from there. It's also nice to um, vary it up a little bit and have some video demonstrations. Um, you can even do um, any training program. May also, you may also consider having shadowing be a component of it, whether it's, um, whether it's new providers being monitored via webcam or of audio. Um, but I would add one cautionary note. Um, most providers um, experienced in clinical medicine may be a little bit irked by being shadowed for the first time in 10 or 20 years, um, even if they're new to telemedicine. So the take home message here is just to know your learners and new providers may have different training needs than experienced providers. So I'll share a little bit about um, the basics of the curriculum. Again, not just to talk about what we're doing, but just to use this as an example of all the pieces that can be in any training program. Um, there are many ways to, to look at this, and there's no one right way. What we chose to do um, is to break this into modules and then organize them according to theme. Uh, we started with just some basics. Um, it's important in the beginning, um, what we term Telemedicine 101, just to talk about the history of telemedicine, how webcams work, um, what the legality is, what rules are. Um, and just to, just to provide a, a basic introduction. Um, we also chose, and we felt it was important for providers to also think of what this was like from the patient's end. So we talked about patient um, satisfaction in telemedicine and obviously the, um, the pluses and minuses that go along with this and um, tried to make this specific to telemedicine. We also talked, um, spent a lot of time talking about the actual conducting of a virtual visit. What is it like to sit in front of a webcam? How does this different from a regular uh, clinic interview? Um, what are some considerations? How do you troubleshoot? 
Um, so things like that. So we have a, it's maybe useful to have a mixture of presentations and video demonstrations for this. Um, then we moved on to just core clinical content. So um, what we termed the virtual examination, uh, we have content just based on how do you actually examine a patient? Um, how do you get, um, what, what can you do, when, what can you not do? And again, this highlights scope of practice issues. And um, we found it was very important to be very honest when there are pieces that you simply cannot do via telemedicine. And we always point out um, where providers should make decisions uh, to recommend in-person care. Um, that's, a, that's a key piece of any telemedicine program is to identify um, when, that is, when that's needed. Um, we also present all of our guidelines based on um, the indiv individual conditions that we see most commonly as a system. And then finally, um, talking with your listeners about any system specific issues. So, uh, so what is your software? What are your institutional regulations and policies? And with that, I will I will hand it back to Ben as well to talk a little bit about some data that um, that inform uh, the creation of a curriculum. So so in looking at the, the content itself that that's included in the curriculum, um, in our experience, providers providers love data, um, and when they are now embarking on telemedicine, um, you know, in, in, in providers who, who are brand new to telemedicine. They love seeing data. So, uh, so the way we did it was presenting, uh, you know, the, the clinical studies and, and evidence that is out there um, regarding quality of care, cost effectiveness, patient satisfaction, uh, you know, just some of the areas where where there clearly exists data supporting uh, the use of telemedicine um, in you know in specialty care, in primary care, uh, in remote monitoring situations. So. So we, we feel it's critically important to to share with your providers uh, the rationale you know in delivering telemedicine and and, and getting the clinical buy-in uh, you know to to you know support the delivery of telemedicine and you know furthermore in looking at you know, specific uh, assessment and specific um, uh, you know, diagnosis um, you know we also uh, pulled a lot of data from from studies that evaluated how to do a virtual assessment and uh, comparing in-person assessments with virtual assessments uh, and, and really showing to providers that, uh, you know, in, in this situation, in this example, we're, we're looking at orthopedic measures and, uh, and, and really showing that uh, the, um, you know, there, there really wasn't a lot of variation in, in doing an exam virtually um, or in person. So, so this is you know the type of data that that we think is is really important in getting um, your providers to to buy into uh, delivering care uh, in this way. Um, and then you know how is it working for for our own team? Um, you know I think uh, you know some of the the early returns have have been have been positive. Um, you know we do uh, patient surveys for for all of our visits, and um, you know which is certainly important to uh, you know, to our to the care that we deliver, but we also do our we do surveys for our own providers. to uh, determine how how are they doing? How do they feel like um, you know they're they're delivering care? Um, and you know, and 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 right now you know it's 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 certainly positive in that you know our providers you know, feel like telemedicine is uh, is a big part of their career, um, and and they want it to be a part of their career going forward. Um, and then I think you know the, one of the telling uh, responses was that. Uh, that this professionally satisfies them. Uh, you know, that was certainly a concern of ours in, in transitioning from an in-person practice to a virtual practice. Uh, you know, would providers uh, mutiny? Would they, would they leave? Would they not enjoy delivering care this way? Um, you know, and, 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 and right now, you know, we, we found that not to be true. Um, is that because of the training? Is it because of the actual encounters? Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know it's it's probably a little bit of both. So, um, you know, so so we you know really feel that uh, you know, to get a clinician buy-in, um, you, know, you know, we need to make sure that um, what they're doing um, you know, is is satisfying for them and for their patients. So, um, you know, so this is certainly uh, certainly possible and certainly doable um, you know, with your organizations as well. So, so I'm going to uh, send it back over to Aaron, and we're going to show you a little bit of our outcomes and, and how it relates to um, to the training program that we've we've developed. 
Thanks, Ben. So here's an interesting graphic depicting what we have encountered in virtual urgent care. And obviously, just by the nature of our business, mostly what we see are, are common acutes. But um, this brings up an important point that any organization needs to ask itself when you're starting a virtual care program is what are you going to be seeing clinically? So you may, even if you're seeing the same population that you see in clinic or in a hospital system, you may be seeing different issues and you may be seeing these same patients uh, present with different agendas. Um, when they present virtually. So uh, the cr whatever curriculum you design needs to be aligned with the clinical content of your visits. And they, this may not, this may be something that's surprising to you, um, what, what you see. So having some good data collection system on what you're seeing to inform uh, the you know, subsequent um, maintenance of your curriculum uh, is an important thing. Uh, this also argues for the need, further for the need for telemedicine specific training. Also, having a formal system for follow-up can be an important issue in ongoing provider training um, and quality assurance. And obviously, in a primary care setting, it may not be feasible to institute um, such a program. But for some cases, it can definitely be a nice adjunct. Um, since virtual care is already at risk of being detached and runs the risk of absence of continuity, uh, follow-up can help bridge this. Uh, and this can also be by, uh, by conducting follow-up and gathering some data in regards to outcomes. It can be one means by which you measure the success of your curriculum. Is your curriculum adequately training your providers uh, to see, uh, to deal with the issues that they're encountering? So in our own efforts, we've obtained a lot of useful data um, on our own quality of care, on patient satisfaction, on outcomes. Um, and also, when providers are new to virtual care, this can also be one avenue by which uh, your providers get some feedback on their own um, on their own virtual visits and how they're doing. Uh, prescribing policies, um, obviously, this is this is a big deal, and your own policies will likely uh, differ compared to your policies for in-person care. Um, in our experience, and in most telemedicine organizations' experience, uh, we've chosen to not provide, not prescribe any controlled substances. Uh, we just felt that this was most appropriate, um, both in terms of patient safety and liability. Uh, but one of the largest issues we do face is um, is antibiotics and patient requests for and hopes for antibiotics. Um, this is obviously more specific to virtual urgent care, um, but uh, but it's encountered by not just us, but a lot of different organizations. So, so we have identified a number of factors that um, that can keep these that can keep these rates down. Um, the first one is that. Um, when possible, patient satisfaction measures um, in regards to cases where there were, was question of antibiotics should not be linked uh, to provider compensation um, or bonuses. So that's one piece where um, when, if you do have a bonus structure, it does need to be very careful in this regard. Um, guidelines in any provider training does need to objectively state um, when antibiotics are or are not appropriate. Um, third, providers should be trained or refreshed on scripts or messaging uh, for patients in this regard. Um, keeping in mind that um, patients may be a little more assertive or push harder in virtual care than in person, and this is especially the case if they're paying out of pocket, which is often the case with, uh, with uh, telemedicine programs, because um, virtual urgent care does select for individuals who may have self-diagnosed or have a certain expectation up front of getting a prescription. Um, and then finally, so number four, any marketing materials need to clearly state policies to shape pe patient expectations up front. So when we have taken some of these uh, measures into account, we have been able to keep our rates low and we are always endeavoring to, to get our rates even lower. So we also recommend um, having a formal QA program as part of any telemedicine program. This serves both an educational role and obviously a traditional QA role. Since there still is some skepticism about the safety of webcam visits, and in, um, in some contexts, this is a very uh, this is a very crucial piece. So most organizations will already have a QA uh, program in place. Uh, you may need to suss this out and add a telemedicine component to it, or even create an entire new program.
So as, as Ben mentioned earlier, patient satisfaction rates for telemedicine in general are very high, but we, don't, we feel that this does not occur automatically. Uh, negative experiences are often due to unfulfilled expectations for prescription, um, and in some cases due to technical issues. Um, but we want to bring up the important point that we feel that focusing on um, complete robust provider training and provider satisfaction does have a trickle-down effect um, in some ways into patient satisfaction as well. So telemedicine is a very, um, it's very fun for providers, especially for providers who may be used to in-person care. It's novel, it's different, um, it's just an entirely different set of issues. And I think the better trained your providers are, uh, the more retention you will have and um, the more satisfied your patients will be as well. So, so in summary, we feel that virtual care is a unique competency uh, that has a fundamentally different set of uh, clinical issues and administrative issues. Um, most of the current workforce there is not well versed in any of the nuances um, of telemedicine. Um, we feel that training and education should be crafted and deployed to accommodate this new um, avenue of care, and it also needs to be flexible enough to support busy providers, uh, not just adding to their workload, but possibly increasing their job satisfaction and making their jobs more enjoyable and even fun. And that concludes the bulk of our presentation. And we just wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. If anybody has um, any questions, um, we would love to, uh, we'd be happy to answer some of those now if you wanna type anything into the, um, into the chat window. But um, we wish you all the best of luck in, cre in uh, creating whatever programs you are working on. Uh, Gary and Ben, uh, this is Bob. And I just wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, presentation uh, coming around to see us um, virtually, of course. Um, if anyone has questions, the Q&A pod is available if you have uh, ideas that you'd like to have uh, addressed or thoughts that you'd like to have responses to. Go ahead and type them in there. If not, I will just say uh, thank you all for attending and, and thanks to our presenters. Gary and Ben, and um, I remind you that we would like to have you take a survey giving us your idea. Oh, we have a couple questions. Gentlemen. Okay, great. So, Leah, it looks like we do have a few questions here. Um, So, uh, so the first question is, can you expand a bit on how you train your physicians to overcome uh, parts of the exam? Uh, and I'm having trouble reading the, the rest of it, but... Um, well, ben, it's, so in terms the rest of, of it is... Uh, well, go ahead, Bob. You can't do virtually such as call patients. Right, right. So, so great question, and um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll start, and then I'm, I'm sure Aaron can can answer this as well. Um, so, so a big piece of of the training is, um, you know, is on the the virtual examination. Um, what are the what are the things that can be done uh, from a physical examination standpoint? So, so we often enlist the patient in uh, in participating in their exam. Uh, so if there are um, you know issues with um, you know, a, a, you know palpation and um, and we feel like a patient can do that appropriately, um, you know I think for uh, for a you know woman with a potential pyelonephritis, uh, palpating their their sides, palpating their flanks um, is a way that we can engage a patient in in helping to determine if there's uh, you know, if there's pain or not. Um, but the big piece of it really is if we feel that an in-person examination. Uh, is is necessary for an appropriate diagnosis and management, then then that patient will be uh, you know will be referred on to an in-person evaluation. Um, but but we've we've really found that um, you know that that a lot of things where initially a provider may not uh, may not think can be done virtually uh, regarding an exam um, can be done, and those are the pieces that we um, that we really focus on in the uh, you know, in the training. Yep. And just adding to that, um, up front, uh, a, a very common um, 
issue we see with a lot of providers new to this is they tend to see it in a black and white issue. They do, you know, they'll ask, well, how can you do an exam? How, you know, we don't have a stethoscope, et cetera. So they tend to see it as an all or nothing thing. And what we are very careful to do in training providers is just to break it down where there are certain things you can do. There are probably more things you can do than you realize, but there are certain things you can't. And so there, there are gray zones there. And just to know that um, doing telemedicine does not mean that you need to step outside your comfort zone and treat something if you, um, where you don't feel you have enough evidence. So the, the cardinal rule is that if you feel a physical exam is going to aid or inform your clinical decision making, then a physical exam should happen. And that's when it gets escalated beyond telemedicine. And usually when, when providers realize that it's not a black and white issue, um, then they're, they're fairly comfortable with that. The, the other thing I'll mention is that um, you know, we're also seeing a lot, of, uh, a lot of momentum behind home diagnostic tools. So whether that's a home otoscope, uh, you know, a, a, an iPhone stethoscope, um, things like that, that, that patients are, are beginning to now have at the home. Um, so in those situations, our guidelines are now uh, evolving to, to support that. So if a provider or a patient has an image of, uh, you know, of, their, of their child's uh, you know, TM, um, or they can, they can actually have, um, have an, you know, an you know, audible exam of their um, you know, heart and lungs, you know, can we use that? Is it appropriate to make a diagnosis using that data? So I think those are the other pieces to consider as, as we see more and more diagnostic tools in the hands of patients. Um, so it looks like there's another, another great question. So how much handholding yeah. do you provide uh, for the providers with the technology? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, I, I think um, you know, this, again, um, it, you know, kind of speaks to the fact that all providers are not um, equally facile with with technology. Um, so so what we've done, um, you know, at, at Karina is, you know, we have a a, a very robust um, IT team and um, you know support team that that does help with our providers, um, you know, who, who may not be um, completely comfortable with technology. Um, but I think more simply is that we try to find technology that is uh, that is easy to use. Um, our all of our systems are are web based. Uh, platform so a provider just really needs to be on a on a on a web browser um, you know, with with a webcam enabled um, you know so we try and really limit the the techn technological issues that a that a provider may have um, often there's a lot of patient handholding that our providers have to deal with where a patient may not be familiar with using a webcam or there's audio issues so I think a lot of our providers have become uh, IT support professionals to some extent. Uh, Aaron, you could probably uh, you could probably speak to that. Yes, quite a bit. And we, I mean, and you do have to get creative at times. There's a lot of troubleshooting involved. There's oftentimes when you do get it connected, um, um, the resolution may be pretty terrible on the patient patient's end. So we may have to, you know, default to getting a digital photo instead of um, instead of using webcam. But but one interesting thing is is even with these technical issues, um, typically having a good um, just a good supportive provider. Um, we still have very high, we see very high patient satisfaction um, even when these technical issues are present. So that has never been a, a major roadblock to, to our success. Um, I want to I, I want to segue from here. I see one other question there, and I want to address it before we run out of time. There's a question about licensure in different um, states we got from one of our listeners. So um, so obviously licensure laws uh, does vary quite a bit state to state, as does the licensure process. So, um, so number one, yes, our providers need to be licensed in whatever state that the, the patient is located in and be governed by those laws. And it's, it's pretty important to know uh, the difference. This is going to affect... Um, PAs and nurse practitioners more so than physicians because scope of practice laws do vary uh, so much in these states. And, you know, for example, there are some states where um, nurse practitioners just, you know, would not be able to operate. So, so in making those decisions, you really do need to do need to know the individual laws of, of individual states. So um, looks like a, a a few more questions. So, um, so the first one is: there a video example of of an exam? Um, the knee, for example, um, is that available? Um, so, you know, as, as we mentioned before, you know, a big piece of, of what we do um, in in the training is, um, is is shadowing as well. So, a lot of our 
um, you know, all of our providers you know, before they actually deliver um, care on their own, they are um, you know, watching our existing providers deliver care. So, so in those situations, they're able to, um, you know, to watch, uh, you know, watch examinations take place for, you know, for a variety of, of clinical conditions. Um, we also, in the training itself, we we perform some mock examinations where we, um, you know, we, we show how a patient can be examined for, um, you know, for a sinus infection, for instance, or for orthopedic concern. So, um, so so a lot of that is is done uh, both, uh, you know, both both live you know, during exam or or during during the training itself. Yep. And we got another question about how many um, how many of the visits are video or just audio. And increasingly, um, they have been increasingly video as time has has gone on. And I think there's a, there are a number of factors for this. Initially, um, even some of our providers, even though they are very excited about telemedicine, are still um, we're still a little bit anxious about it. And it was just more in their comfort zone to be on the phone. And for a lot of conditions, this is actually appropriate where um, the history is going to give far more information than you know than any examination would be so they still do default to um, to phone at sometimes but but increasingly um, I, I don't know any actual percentages but but an increasing number are, are video and and even sometimes you know if, if I'm on a shift the majority of mine will be on on video now but again this is also patient dependent some patients would prefer just to just to do it over the phone but if i feel uh they need to be seen we'll definitely find a way to escalate it so i can visualize them in some fashion so um looks like another question here do you train outside providers um so so yes we do so that's actually um in process as we speak now we are um you know we work uh, closely with with health systems in delivering um, you know, virtual urgent care, um, and and our health system partners have have found that to get it up and running quickly, it's it's um, uh, you know, it's great to use uh, you know, Carina providers, but ultimately they want to use their own providers. Um, so we are actually currently training uh, you know, training health system providers to um, uh, to deliver care in, in the in the same way that that we deliver care. So um, so yes, that's that's um, you know, a really a big piece of, of what, what we think is, is the future of, of what we're doing. Um, where we want to enable, uh, you know, existing, um, you know, existing providers to deliver care for, for their own patients. And we've, we've also found a, a mix, uh, just different receptions of this, oftentimes from an administrative level um, with other organizations, people will be very excited about telemedicine. On the provider level, there's definitely more skepticism because I think a lot of, especially in primary care, a lot of busy providers are just fearful that this is going to add to their their clinical workload. So it's it's a it's something to consider when when adding telemedicine because most systems are not going to want to take away uh, their clinical hours because that's where most reimbursement is going to come from. Um, so when considering this, you need to you know take steps to make sure your providers are not just going to be uh, burned out and and burdened by the addition of a telemedicine component. Well, gentlemen, thank you again. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming in, although my screen is going totally wonky, and I'm getting a, an interesting Q&A pod. Uh, seeing as there doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in, uh, Martha is showing you the survey that we'd like to have you take that told us not only what you thought about today's webinar, which is very important to us, but also what you would like to see in future webinars, or if you have Suggestions for speakers who would uh, be good for a webinar. Let us know, and we'll do our best to schedule that. We're filling out our dance card for next year, and we'd be very happy to uh, include anybody that you're interested in. Try to find somebody that's good for a subject that you'd like to hear about. So, with that, uh, Ben and Aaron, thank you very much for joining us. It was a great webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, to all our audience, thank you for joining us, and please do the uh, survey. Very much. Thank you. Thanks so much.
I've been here and I don't see any more questions coming in. So thanks for so much. And uh, I hope to see you in Seattle. Okay.